you've just seen opened the United Nations Conference on the Protection of the Ozone Layer, held in London in March 1989, hosted by Margaret Thatcher's government and attended by 156 nation states. The issue that brought nearly every nation in the world to one site was the discovery by a British scientist, Joe Farman, of a huge hole in the ozone layer over Antarctica. It was a seasonal event, a phenomenon which appears at the end of every Antarctic winter, reaches its most severe during October, and then disperses throughout the whole southern hemisphere, only to reform the following year. The mechanisms of this event and the chemical reactions which underlie it are now well established, but when the discovery was originally made in 1984, the scientists involved in the British Antarctic Survey couldn't believe that their observations were real. So great was the deviation from normal that their initial reaction was to assume that something had gone seriously wrong with their ground-based instruments. Only after exhaustive checks had been made did the scientists submit their observations to the scientific journal Nature, where it was published in 1985. Further confirmation came when data from the Nimbus 7 satellite was analysed, which showed that the ground-up observations by the British scientists were confirmed by the United States observations from space. It is the view of many people that the ozone hole over Antarctica is the most important scientific discovery of the second half of the 20th century. Joe Farman, you're going to go down in history as the man who discovered the hole in the ozone layer over Antarctica. When you first knew it was there, what was your initial reaction? Well, first one of disbelief and then one of sheer horror because it suddenly dawned on one how it could start. But at that stage, it wasn't very clear to see how it would stop. And indeed, it's still not very clear to see how it will stop. And at that point, did you actually understand what the implications were for the environment, for the world? Not really. No, it was not easy to see how it could spread from Antarctica. But nevertheless, it was the first real sign that man had, had done something rather nasty to the planet. Mm -hmm. We're looking here at a profile of what you saw. Can you describe it? Yes, indeed. The, these are vertical profiles. They correspond to two balloon flights made from Halley Bay in, in 1987. Uh, in, we're here at about 14 kilometres and here at about 30 kilometres. Uh, this is the lower part of the atmosphere, which is very strongly mixed, so the ozone amount is relatively small. And then here we have a typical winter Antarctic ozone layer with a peak uh, right here. And you can see in just six weeks all the peak has been completely whipped away and something like 99% of the ozone at this height level here has been destroyed. It's really intensely dramatic. How extraordinary was that? Was this the first time it had ever happened, do you think? Almost certainly, yes. I mean, we, we know it didn't happen uh, since 1956 and, and really most of us are quite sure that nothing like this has happened in the world's history before. Mm. So that's what you were looking at from the ground up. The Americans were looking at it from space. What did they see? Well, you can get these lovely coloured maps of ozone over the southern hemisphere. Here we've got the South Pole and Antarctica, South America, uh, Africa and Australia. And huge amounts of ozone out in this, uh, what we call the ring, the warm belt here. And low ozone fringing Antarctica, but no signal from Antarctica itself because that's still in darkness. And what time of the year is this now? This is September. There's the sun's coming back. Remember that uh, the sun doesn't come back to the pole until the 21st of September, so there's sunlight out here, but still a little darkness in the middle. And now you'll see, once the sun comes back, the hole deepens very, very rapidly indeed. Here we go. That's the beginning of it. And now the pink bits will spread out. And that huge pink space is, in fact, the ozone That's hole. That's the ozone hole, yes. How big is the hole? Well, it varies a bit, but roughly it's the size of Antarctica, that's to say from the pole out to about 65 degrees latitude. Uh, that's probably not easy for most people to think about. It's roughly the size of the United States or getting on for uh, all of Europe going up to the Ural Mountains, I suppose. And what time of year is that? This is halfway through October now. The sun's been back for a month, so we've had complete photolysis. You have to understand we're lucky at the moment. Uh, ozone, to destroy ozone, you must have sunlight. If we can invent something which will destroy ozone in the darkness, we're in very deep trouble. The question which then arises is, what has caused this extraordinary phenomenon? Well, it's important to realise that the whole process of ozone depletion had been predicted ten years previously by two scientists, Molina and Rowland.
In 1974, they published a paper in Nature pointing out that the use of chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, and other man-made chemicals posed a possible threat to the integrity of the ozone layer. Such chemicals are extremely stable, so they can permeate up through the lower atmosphere and aren't broken down until they are exposed to the intense ultraviolet radiation which exists in the stratosphere. At this point, a series of chemical reactions occur which result in the catalytic destruction of ozone. Thus, chlorine combines with ozone to form chlorine monoxide and oxygen. The chlorine monoxide then combines with one atom of oxygen to form molecular oxygen and chlorine. Note that one molecule of ozone has been lost, but the free radical chlorine has been regenerated and is now available to react with further molecules of ozone and so the cycle is repeated again and again and again. This is the basis of a catalytic reaction. It is unfortunate that governments did not take these predictions seriously. Only in America was the use of CFCs in aerosols banned. But the chemical industry is very resourceful. New uses for CFCs were found in food packaging, home insulation, refrigeration, air conditioning and the cleaning of electronic circuitry so that by 1985, world production of CFCs had reached a million metric tonnes annually and was growing at 5 to 10 per cent per annum. But the question which perplexed the scientists was, why Antarctica? If CFCs are being released all over the industrialised world, why should the pristine wastes of the southern hemisphere bear the brunt of the attack? Dr. John Pyle of the Department of Chemistry at Cambridge University, you head the European Ozone Research Unit. Now, why has the ozone hole appeared over Antarctica? It was a surprise that the ozone hole appeared there. We now know from measurements that have been made that there are two particular conditions in Antarctica that, that give rise to the ozone hole. One is that the Antarctic lower stratosphere is very cold, and what that leads to is the formation of, of clouds in the stratosphere. We call them polar stratospheric clouds. And reactions on these cloud particles can turn chlorine into particular compounds, chlorine monoxide, which can destroy ozone very rapidly when there is sunlight present. Those are then the, 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 the prime conditions for ozone depletion. It's got to be cold, and then you've got to have some sunlight. And those conditions are present together, widespread in the southern uh, hemisphere in the springtime. And what's happening in the northern hemisphere? Well, measurements that have been taken over the last couple of years show that, indeed, in the northern hemisphere, we have as high amounts of these ozone-destroying chlorine compounds as we do in the south. This, for example, shows satellite data taken in January 1992. Uh, it shows the chlorine monoxide concentration at about 20 kilometers altitude. The red over here shows a very high concentration, comparable to those when the Antarctic ozone hole forms. And you can see uh, that that, in this sequence, is covering uh, northern Britain and much of Scandinavia and quite a bit of northern Europe. And those conditions pertain right throughout the month. You can see the, these high concentrations building up and spreading right across the United Kingdom, covering much of populated northern Europe. So a large part of Europe covered by these, these, these very dangerous compounds. So given those levels of pollution, why is there an ozone hole over Antarctica and not over the Northern Hemisphere? The reason that we don't have a hole to the same extent is partly because of the timing of, of, of the phenomenon in the two hemispheres. It has to be cold. It was cold in January uh, 92 to produce these high levels of chlorine compounds, but there was not much sunlight around at this time of the year in midwinter to initiate the, the chemistry. We would have to have these levels of chlorine present in March and April to get an ozone hole in the north. Well, does all this matter? What function does the ozone layer serve? And what will happen if it is seriously depleted? Basically, ozone has been a crucial requirement for the development of life on Earth as we know it today. Part of the sun's energy is emitted as ultraviolet radiation. And this is divided into three wave bands, UVA, UVB and UVC. UVA is not much affected by the ozone layer, whereas UVC is eliminated completely. UVB is greatly reduced. UVC is lethal for living organisms, particularly microorganisms, such as plankton, which reside in the surface layer of the ocean.
UVB is damaging to larger life forms, including human beings, where it causes skin cancer and cataracts. But what is less well known is that increased levels of UVB adversely affects the growth of many plants and agricultural crops. Dr. Jeff Holmes, Senior Research Fellow at the Department of Plant Sciences at Cambridge University, has made a special study of this issue. You've got two groups of plants here. Um, what is the experiment that you're running? These are experiments from last year. They received additional UVB last year. Here, for example, are some oak seedlings. And as you can see, they look relatively healthy. These received UVB last in approximately November. And over here, you've got some oak trees that are uh, sort of more normal. This is how they should look. And they look, to the uninformed eye, less healthy than the treated ones. They're, they're actually perfectly healthy, but what it is is they're two weeks behind, or to put it another way, the UVB treated are two weeks ahead in their development. And is there a problem with that? Yes, probably, because the temperature controls in many ways when plants produce their buds. And what might happen is that if they produce their buds and open their leaves two weeks earlier and there is a frost, the tree leaves could be damaged. So the bottom line is that although to my eyes these look much poorer specimens, in the, in the long run they'll have yes. a much healthier future. Absolutely, absolutely. Now you've got an experiment running here with how many different varieties of trees? Eight different uh, species here. And what yeah. trees do you know are suffering because of increased UVB? Well, ash and sycamore are definitely affected by small increases in UVB. By affected I mean they grow less, they produce less dry matter in a year. How do you think the British landscape is going to change? Well, I think in the case of trees, you're going to see a few species decreasing in number quite rapidly. Uh, and what about the other flora? I know you've looked at uh, chalk downlands. Yes, that's perhaps a little more interesting, where we looked at four different species, and we modelled from the basis of three years' work what would happen over the next 50 years, with just a small increase, only 20% increase in UVB. That's only about a 10% depletion in the ozone layer. And what we found was that two or three species would be totally eliminated after 40 years, and effectively, in brief, the perennial thistle out of these would dominate. That's not a pretty sight on the chalk downlands at all. What about what's happening in the sea, Jeff? The sea is a much more complex situation. UVB does penetrate very well into clear water, and that's what experiments are normally based on. In fact, where there's life, it's usually turbid and muddy. Well, not exactly muddy, but at least turbid. And under those situations, the UVB doesn't penetrate very far. But isn't it actually going to affect marine life substantially. Isn't that one of the things that's most under threat? It may in some instances, but I, th I would suspect generally not, because some, don't forget, many organisms can migrate away from UVB. I suppose in that they have the advantage over the plants, which have to grow where they end up. That is the main problem. The plants, the plants are the ones I worry about, not because of my interest in plants, but because they can't move. We can move into the shade or put on a hat. The plants are stuck there. Many sea organisms can move and they've adapted, as I say, to do this. Terrestrial plants can't. Well, now I'd like to turn to the man who's been responsible for the production of this film. Robin Russell-Jones is a consultant dermatologist at St Thomas's Hospital with a long-standing interest in environmental issues. Dr Russell-Jones, what types of skin cancer will be affected if there is significant ozone depletion? Well, there's two main types of skin cancer that are affected by sunlight. One is melanoma and the other is non-melanoma skin cancer. Non-melanoma skin cancer is divided into two main types. The commonest type is a rodent ulcer, or basal cell carcinoma, seen here. It doesn't spread around the body, and people very seldom die of it. The other type of non-melanoma skin cancer is squamous cell carcinoma. This is a more dangerous type of skin cancer. It can metastasize. Probably about 1% of them metastasize, so they can kill the patient. Uh, the most dangerous type of skin cancer, however, is melanoma. And for the purposes of this discussion, there are two main sorts of melanoma. The superficial spreading melanoma seen here and the uh, nodular malignant melanoma shown here. And this type of skin cancer has a mortality of about 25 to 30 percent. And the other important thing about it is it affects a younger age group than the non-melanoma skin cancer. Those are mainly a disease of old age. So what evidence is there that these skin cancers are in fact related to sun exposure? Well, they're much commoner in people with white skin. And the fairer your skin type uh, and the more sun exposure you have, the more likely you are to develop these types of cancer. You can actually get epidemiological data which plots 
the incidence of these different types of cancer against ultraviolet dose, or if you like, against latitude. And you can see that as you move towards the equator, the incidence of these three types of skin cancer increases. Basal cell carcinoma is the commonest at the top. Squamous cell carcinoma is the second most common, and melanoma is the rarest. But of course, as I said, that doesn't mean it's the least important. You'll see that the relationship between ultraviolet dose and incidence is strongest for squamous cell carcinoma because this is a steeper uh, line than the other two. Which are the most dangerous wavelengths? Well, that's a very good question. To answer that question, you have to go to an experimental animal model, such as an albino mouse, and you have to expose that mouse to different wavelengths, and you see which is the most efficient uh, at producing skin cancers. And this, you then get what's called an action spectrum. And along the horizontal axis is the wavelength, and up the vertical axis is a log scale. So when you go from this 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 3, that's a tenfold increase, 100-fold, 1,000-fold increase with each increment. And you can see that the most effective wavelength for the production of skin cancer is around 300, just above 300, which is smack in the middle of the UVB range, which is, of course, the type of UV light that's increased if ozone depletes. So that's why we're concerned about skin cancer. What's the relationship between ozone depletion and non-melanoma skin cancer? Well, you have to use the data that I've shown you, which looks at the action spectrum and also looks at the relationship between incidence and latitude to derive various factors which relate ozone depletion to these different types of skin cancer. But you then get a factor, which is the total amplification factor, which is the percent increase in that particular skin cancer that you get from a 1% loss of ozone. And uh, for basal cell carcinoma, a 1% loss of ozone will give you a 2.8% increase in the incidence of basal cell carcinoma, all other things being equal. For squamous cell carcinoma, it's a bigger increase. It's about 4.5%, and that's because the relationship between squamous cell carcinoma and latitude is stronger than it is for basal cell carcinoma. And how many cases does that represent, do you think, for the US and the UK? Well, there's about 500,000 new cases of non-melanoma skin cancer per annum in the US. So you're looking at something like 175,000 number increase uh, each year if you had a 10% loss of ozone, which is quite feasible given the present, the way things are going at present. One has to say that that assumes that all other factors remain equal. So what can we do to protect ourselves? Well, what we need to do is to have less sun exposure, so it means not going out at times of day when the sun is at its strongest. But that, of course, means that we've altered the chemistry of the atmosphere to such an extent that we have to alter our lifestyle. Uh, for those who insist on going out uh, in the sun, then they need to protect themselves, either by wearing decent clothing, such as wide-brimmed hats, or by putting on sunblock. But if you use sunblock, of course, you're really using one class of chemical to protect yourself against the results of another class of chemical that you've released into the atmosphere. And I think we ought to be able to organize our lives rather better than that. My personal preference is that we solve the problem by banning completely the chemicals that cause the problem in the first place, which is the CFCs and the halons and their substitutes. Let's now look at what the world community has achieved so far. In 1987, an international agreement called the Montreal Protocol was drawn up by the United Nations to limit the production of ozone-depleting chemicals. This proposed that by the end of the century there would be a 50% cut in the production of CFCs and halons, which are bromine-bearing compounds widely used in fire extinguishing systems. It was soon realized, however, that the measures proposed were insufficient to protect the ozone layer, and the protocol has now been extended to include other ozone-depleting chemicals. CFCs will be banned by the year 1995, and halons will be banned by the end of 1994. However, this is not going to be the end of the story. First, the agreement is voluntary, and not all countries have ratified the protocol. Second, developing nations have a 10-year delay. And third, many of the chemicals being developed by industry as substitutes for the CFCs are very expensive, so there's no guarantee that countries such as China or India will actually use them. What would have happened if the Montreal Protocol had not been tightened? Well, the Environmental Protection Agency in America ran a number of computer models to predict what would happen. The natural level of uh, chlorine in the atmosphere is about 0.6 parts per billion 
uh, the hole over Antarctica appeared somewhere around two parts per billion. We're now at about three or above three now parts per, per billion. Under the Montreal Protocol Phase 1, chlorine levels were predicted to rise from 3 to 14 parts per billion by the end of the next century. I think that would have been a fairly terminal event. Um, what will happen next with the revised protocol in force? Well, they've had various phase-out dates for the CFCs and the other ozone-depleting chemicals, and if we take the mid-scenario, and with a 2000 phase-out date, we're going to get to almost 5 parts per billion of chlorine before levels start to decline. And that's assuming full compliance um, by all the signatory nations. And that's by no means certain because, for example, uh, India has recently deregulated the production of fridges and air conditioning units, which suggests that they might be trying to evade their international responsibilities. Under the new revised European proposals, they may phase them out by about 1995, but I still think that chlorine will get above four parts per billion. So we're still... Um, scheduled for some uh, major increases in atmospheric chlorine. So how long is the hole going to be with us? Well, we know that it appeared somewhere between 1.5 and 2 parts per billion, and you can see that even if you get full compliance with the Montreal Protocol, you're still not going to get back to 2 parts per billion until well into the next century. So I think the ozone hole over Antarctica is going to be with us for the next century at least. There is, however, another major environmental problem caused by CFCs and their substitutes. They're all potent greenhouse gases and will contribute substantially to the problem of global warming. The greenhouse effect occurs because the sun's energy can penetrate the Earth's atmosphere but cannot escape. Energy reflected back from the Earth's surface is absorbed by gases such as carbon dioxide, thus warming the atmosphere and raising the temperature of the oceans. However, carbon dioxide is not the only gas which does this. CFCs and substitute chemicals such as HCFCs and HFCs are much more efficient heat absorbers than is carbon dioxide. Dr. Russell Jones, are these substitutes going to be a help? Well, they may help the ozone layer, but they're not going to help from the point of view of global warming because all these chemicals are potent greenhouse gases. I mean, the CFCs, the fully halogenated ones, have um, global warming potentials four to 6,000 times greater than an equivalent weight of CO2 over a 20-year time scale. But if you look at HCFC 22, it's got 3,600 times the global warming potential of CO2. And if this was uncontrolled, by the year 2030, it would be contributing 15% of global warming due to CO2 alone. HFC 134A, uh, has got a global warming potential 2,800 times that of CO2. And by the end of the next century, that could be contributing 15% of global warming due to CO2 alone. So whilst these things may be slightly less damaging, as far as the ozone layer is concerned, they're completely unacceptable uh, as far as other environmental uh, processes are concerned. Peterhouse is the oldest college in Cambridge. Dr. Russell Jones is a former scholar, and here in the gardens within the college, he's joined by the scientists from whom we've already heard. John, could I come back to the question of um, other man-made chemicals? We've talked about chlorine. What about bromine? Is that a significant contributor to the ozone depletion? Calculations would suggest that possibly a third of the ozone loss might be due to, to bromine chemistry. It, it varies from, from calculation to calculation. I mean, I always thought the main problem was halons, fire extinguishers, <coughs> uh, but those have been sort of mainly controlled by the Montreal Protocol. But I understand, Joe, that there's now another bromine-bearing hazard <coughs> in the shape of uh, methyl bromide. Could you tell us how that came into uh, being or was allowed to stay in existence? <coughs> we were worried about methyl bromide in, in the 1985 report, but. Uh, because it's so toxic and so nasty, we were told that the industry was going to phase out its use anyhow. But this hasn't happened, in fact. The industrial production has doubled, and, and further research has suggested that something like 50% of the total world production is industrial. And so it, it really overwhelms the, the halons. Uh, Jeff, you've done a lot of work on the effect of increasing ultraviolet B on terrestrial ecosystems, and you've been looking at a variety of plants to see what effect ozone depletion is going to have. Your experiment assumes that ozone depletion is going to proceed along fairly predictable lines, but of course that may not be what happens. It didn't happen in Antarctica that way. 
what would happen if there was a sudden loss of ozone and a sudden increase in uh, ultraviolet B? Well, for the more sensitive species, it could be lethal if it was a large enough quantity, and that might be as much as, or as little as, 30% increase in UVB. And to produce that, you need about a 15% loss of ozone? Approximately, yes. Which is almost what we had this winter. Yes. There's one other thing that concerns me slightly, and I'd like your comments on this. I mean, you're looking at changing one environmental parameter, the amount of UV flux that hits that particular plot of land. But of course, in the real world, there's other things going to be going on as well. I mean, global warming will be on the increase. Um, acid rain won't have improved. Um, impoverishment of the soil may have continued. Uh, what do you think the prospects are for agricultural production in the middle of the next century if we don't get a hold of these different issues? Well, that's an enormously, enormously complex question because there are so many interacting parameters and I don't attempt to look at all of those. It's just physically impossible for a small group of researchers to do that. I think with regard to agricultural crops, I'm not nearly as worried as I am about natural ecosystems because we're not allowed to interfere with natural ecosystems. We can interfere with agricultural crops and we can breed and improve varieties which are somewhat UVB resistant. I can understand how it might be possible to produce a, a plant that is UVB resistant, but it's going to be a very clever plant that is both resistant to UV and the climate extremes that come with global warming and acid rain and soil impoverishment. I mean, do you think we've got enough time to produce that sort of plant? No. <laughs> but that's a very complex question, it has to be said. But it's, it's, it may be complex, facing. but it's simple in the sense that that's probably what's going to happen. Yes. Joe, have you thought about this particular issue of, of, of multiple environmental processes going on simultaneously? Well, yes, indeed. Um, I mean, we talk about reaching the peak of, of chlorine level. Uh, the trouble is we don't know that the rest of the atmosphere is going to stay the same. It may be that, that the same old amount of chlorine and bromine will suddenly become more dangerous with time. And so this is why we really have to, to act very fast and, and to be extremely prudent. If we make the stratosphere colder, for example, as is in, uh, uh, the effect of, of global warming, uh, when, when you warm the surface of the Earth, you actually cool the stratosphere. It's the price you, you pay for it. Uh, this in itself could, could lead to more ozone depletion. So what you're saying is that as the lower atmosphere warms up from global warming, the, the outer atmosphere, the stratosphere, cools down, and that could lead to the production of more polar stratospheric clouds more ice crystal reactions leading to greater ozone depletion over perhaps more heavily populated areas of the globe. That's the story, yes indeed. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that, John? Joe's right. I mean, there would be two effects in calculations if you, if you were doubling CO2. One is that the, the gas phase chemistry would actually, that destroys ozone, would actually go rather more slowly. So, on the one hand, that's a good thing. But on the other hand, you might well, as Joe said, produce more polar stratospheric clouds, and then you'd expect to see a reduction in in, in ozone, the destruction of ozone in the low stratosphere. That's certainly the factor that's winning at the moment. When were CFCs invented? Well, uh, history has been a bit distorted here. It's usually said they were first made by General Motors and DuPont in 1928, 1929, a gentleman called Thomas Midgley. But if you look back, you actually find they were first synthesized by a Belgian chemist way back in 1892. And this is really rather horrifying, because if they'd have come into industrial use then, we could have actually destroyed the ozone layer before we knew how to measure it. And this makes one think, what else have we done to the world? The discovery you made in Antarctica was made in the nick of time. Well, it looks like it. Yes, let's hope so. At the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in Oxfordshire, I've come to visit Sir John Horton, former head of the Meteorological Office, chairman of the Intergovernmental Scientific Assessment Panel on Climate Change, and present chairman of the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution. Sir John, you've obviously looked at and considered the environment from many points of view over your career. Can you put ozone depletion in relation to all the other issues you've looked at? Yes, there are, of course, very many environmental issues. But ozone depletion is a very important one. It's a global issue. Um, the other major global issue that we face is that, is that of global warming. So ozone depletion and global warming are the two big global issues. The IPCC has looked at global warming. What are its main conclusions? The climate is changing because of the greenhouse effect, or the, well, the enhanced greenhouse effect, because more fossil fuels are being burnt and the temperature of the Earth, the average temperature of the Earth, will rise by one or two degrees by the middle of next century. 
Now, how does CFCs and CFC substitutes fit into that? Well, CFCs destroy ozone, of course, on the one hand, but CFCs are also greenhouse gases, and indeed of the, uh, the, uh, of the greenhouse gas emissions in 1990, something like 15% of the greenhouse warming was due to CFCs. The, the solution to the CFC problem seems to be the substitute for the CFCs. Yes. Uh, what's your view on those? Well, the substitutes are, um, don't destroy ozone in the same, to anything like the same extent. But they're, all, they're also greenhouse gases and they also contribute to global warming. So it's not substitute chemicals we need, but completely alternative technology? Yes. Sir Richard Southwood, Vice-Chancellor of Oxford University, Chairman of the National Radiological Protection Board and former Chairman of the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution. Looking at UVB levels in this country, what are we doing to monitor them? Well, the Radiological Protection Board has been monitoring them since 1988 at three sites and we're adding three more sites uh, later this year. So we'll now have sites going all the way from Cornwall up to the Shetlands. And is it important that we're looking at it at different latitudes? I think it's very important to have them at different latitudes because we do know that ozone depletion is strongest at the poles and is spreading out from the poles. Now, has that change in the ozone level um, shown itself up in the levels of UVB? Uh, it hasn't shown itself in the levels of UVB as monitored at ground level in this country by the sort of instruments that are being used. It has been shown in the spectral analyses, I understand, that have been measured in Australia. But of course they have many more clear days than we do and you can't really measure the UVB levels that come through at the uh, ozone layer satisfactorily at ground level except on a clear day. We hear about global warming, we hear about loss of ozone, uh, we hear about them often as two separate issues, but is that dangerous to treat them separately? It's dangerous because they are both part of a pattern, They're part of a pattern that man is disturbing the chemistry of the upper atmosphere. Dr. Russell Jones, since the hole was discovered in the ozone layer in the Antarctic, scientists have discovered an enormous amount. How have politicians reacted to that? Well, it's important that politicians make their contribution to solving the issue. There's only a limited amount that individuals can do. They can stop using hairspray, aerosols, and so on. But when you get down to things like air conditioning and cleaning of electronic circuitry, which are uses of CFCs, only industry can really control that. And it's not acceptable that that is left to industry to solve itself. Government has to legislate if proper controls are to be implemented in these areas. How receptive are politicians? Well, eventually they come round to listening. Uh, in the case of uh, ozone depletion, it only took about four or five years for the government to take things seriously, which is actually very quick uh, for the UK government. But on other issues, such as global warming, they show no indication yet that they're listening or even beginning to implement the right action. David McLean, the Minister for the Environment, had agreed to take part in this film, and then he backed out. Why? Well, I wrote to David McLean asking for an interview, and th they agreed to that. And then I was asked to submit a series of questions, which I did, and I included questions on ozone depletion, and I also included some questions on climate change. And then I received a fax from the press office at the Department of the Environment asking for all sorts of conditions to be imposed upon the interview before the minister would agree to take part. Uh, for example, um, I submitted 18 questions and the minister was only prepared to answer questions 1, 2, 6, 9, 15, 16 and 17, which is seven of the 18 questions. What questions was he prepared to answer? Well, he was prepared to answer questions about ozone depletion because the government thinks it has a policy as regards ozone depletion, whereas it knows it has no policy as regards global warming, and therefore I fear he was not prepared to answer questions on that particular topic. What conclusions do you draw from this whole episode? Well, he is the Minister for the Environment. I mean, he ought to be able to cope with both sets of questions. I found it extraordinary that he wanted to separate artificially these two issues, because, as we know, they're not separated, and certainly in the atmosphere they interact in, in you know, quite unpredictable ways. The second thing was that I had to give a written assurance that the film would be used strictly and only for educational purposes and for no other use. And they even requested to see and comment and approve the rough cut of the film.
So they wanted to know how I intended to conduct the interview, how I intended to edit it, uh, and they wanted to see the product before they would sanction it being used. And my view is that that is completely unacceptable. And as an example of open government, which this government says it is committed to, I found it quite extraordinary. This is one issue we have got to get right. It represents the litmus test of our ability to care for our planet. The discovery by Joe Farman of the ozone hole over Antarctica opened the eyes of people all over the world to the immense fragility of the systems which sustain life on this planet. If we can't solve the relatively simple issue of ozone depletion, what chance do we have with the far greater problem of global warming?